letter in 2 Timothy. I'd like you to stand as we read the section of chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 8. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You will be seated. I've entitled this section, Paul's Swan Song. In this, if it were a song, it and as it is, there are three time signatures. Paul presents in verses six through eight, three time signatures, the present, the past, and the future. He begins here in his final statements as he sees his life and ministry coming to a close. Of course, he's in prison in Rome when execution is imminent. He begins with the present. And the present, he talks about the present sacrifice in verse 6. If I were to title this in another way, it's he's making a statement of living for Christ. His present sacrifice is living for Christ, not living for himself. Paul exemplified that ever since he had gotten saved. He became, he was trained by Christ in the desert for three years. He, he then went out, turned his life around from from persecuting Christians to proclaiming Jesus' message of the gospel and salvation. Of course, Paul himself wrote two-thirds of the New Testament epistles. We see here, he makes this statement in verse 6, 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. Not many places in the New Testament it speaks actually of a drink offering. Uh, the, we haven't been raised Jews or in the Old Testament Hebrews, but there were three basic phases of offerings, kind of like there's three tenses here in terms that Paul is looking at. And in Numbers 15, those first 10 verses of that, it talks about three kinds of offerings that the, that the people of God were to give. The first was the burnt offering. And of course, the burnt offering was after the animal had been sacrificed and the blood had been applied to the people. Then that animal sacrifice that was a pre-shadowing of Christ himself giving his life. That offering was burnt or cooked, and then the priest were, and the, the Levi families were allowed to have that as their food. So there was first the burnt offering, the sacrificial lamb. Then there was also another offering, which was the grain offering. Of course, that is not just the sacrifice of blood being given for their behalf, but the fruit 
that God had provided for them was given, the first fruits of the field, of whether it was whether it was grapes or grain, but it was this was the first fruit spoken of was the grain. So the very first part of the harvest that was made was given to the Lord. Then there was the final drink offering, and the drink offering was the final offering, and it was poured out upon the sacrifice. <coughs> Paul spoke about it when he wrote to the Philippians as pre-shadowing what has come here, because Philippians' a letter was written earlier. But Philippians 2.17 says, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You see, what Paul had poured out was his life in the service of others' faith. That was his drink offering. Because there was no other, no more need for a blood offering. And the very fruit of his life showed forth in, in, his, in his missionary works. And at the very end, it was the service of their faith. As to how does that apply to us, he wrote when he wrote to the Romans, Romans 12, 1, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, not by your own strength, but by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul talked about he's, he had done this. He exhorted others to do this likewise as an example and as the Lord's teaching. Throughout this, I'm going to be quoting a lot of Paul's writing because remember this, we're looking at Paul's life and teaching in his final song, his final statements, what was the most precious to him. Because he was talking then about his departure for heaven. Uh, Warren Wiersbe, a commentator of the past, he wrote uh, that the word, Greek word used for departure was also used in Greek to hoist an anchor and to set sail. The departure of a ship to set sail. Paul was ready to set sail, but he wasn't ready to set sail upon the Mediterranean sea again. He was ready to set sail for into eternity. Paul was ready. That's what he's saying. And we should all be ready when our time comes. It may be today, it might be tomorrow, but be ready to fly away. Be ready to hoist the anchor and go into eternity. Paul was. Also in Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I, I quoted Philippians 1 earlier. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's look at Philippians 1, 21 and 23, first of all. He says at the beginning of the letter to Philippians, he says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I don't know which to choose. I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart again, set, pull that anchor and set sail, having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is very much better. Further on in chapter three of his letter to the Philippians uh, verses uh, seven through 12, he says, for whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. 
and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, nor have already become perfect, but I press on so I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. See, he was ready to set sail. He was ready to go into eternity. That is in this present, in this present sacrifice, we are to be presently ready to go to eternity. Are you ready? He was ready. He's our example. But he also had past service. When we look at verse 7, we see him uh, give three aspects of his past service. And I think it's interesting that he doesn't list, give us a list of his achievements. You know, he doesn't go through that I that he did this. He, be, he started these churches. He, he was a witness here. He gave a message on Mars Hill or whatever. He, he, he doesn't list actual achievements. So as that which he, he did, but basically he just states here in terms of his past service. If we were to put it into a statement, if you want to fill in the blank, it's faithful perseverance. He doesn't list the, all the things that he did or that God accomplished through him, but he was, had faithful perseverance. And in that, it was three aspects. Second Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. First of all, he said he's fought the good fight. The, the Greek word used there for fought we get our English word agonized, uh, but it, it also has the idea of labor, labored or strived. And he said the good fight. He was glad to fight these. And the word fight there was an athletic one. Remember, the, the Greeks had their uh, Olympics and they they had wrestling and boxing. Those were the kinds of fights that they that they they did. We're not talking about the Roman gladiators. We're talking about the competition there uh, at the Olympics that the Greeks had started. It's just a Greek term. He labored and strived, and it, it was wrestling. But it was a good wrestling. You know, this is the sport. <laughs> that all Christians should really want to be involved in. I mean, you know, baseball and football and track and all those things are good, but he's talking about the good fight, the good wrestling. He dedicated to doing the good wrestling, which was wrestling for the Lord, wrestling with the word of God and to be able to wrestle with people in the terms of helping them, teaching them, directing them, comforting them. That's not easy. He wrestled with that. That was the good fight. This is what Paul did. He persevered in it. He uses some of the same terms here when he wrote the first letter to Timothy. First Timothy 4.10, he said, for it is for this we labor and strive. We agonized. We labor and strive. Why? Because why would he do this? Why not just strive after the things of the world or worldly accomplishments of his own or just a life of pleasure? Because, he says, because we have fixed our hope on the living God. Where's your hope fixed? I mean, it's nice to be able to pay for a car, pay off a house, be able to have, take trips, be able to be with family. All those things are good. 
But he strived because he had his hope fixed on the living God. The living God who is a savior of all men, especially of believers. Later on in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. How did he do that? He says, take hold of the eternal life for which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fighting the good fight of faith is taking hold of this eternal life. That's what Paul did. He took hold of the eternal life. That's why he was ready to set sail. That was why he was, he was able to fight the good fight. Because he took hold of the eternal life that Christ had revealed to him and given to him through faith. And he had finished the course. Again, another one of these athletic terms, he was running the race. And he was running the race for Christ. You know, many times they, uh, uh, it, all of the complexities and, and that of being in the world, we call it the rat race. Paul didn't run the rat race. He ran the Christ race. He talks about it in a, uh, there in Acts 20. Luke recorded it, his statement in Acts 20, 24. He says, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Why? So that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord. He received from the Lord Jesus for what? to testify solemnly of the gospel of grace of God. He finished his course of testifying to the grace of, the, of God for the gospel. Again, a lot of this parallels with his letter to the Philippians. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he said, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to that which lies ahead, I press on towards the goal. The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He pressed on for that upward call. You know, much like the author of Hebrews reminds us, says to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Lay aside those encumbrances, those things that slow you down, as well as sins that so easily entangle. But fixing your eyes upon the author and finish of your faith Jesus Christ, who for the hope set before him, he endured the cross. Keep pressing on, press on, press on. Paul pressed on, he pressed on in the race. And thirdly, I have kept the faith. He was trusting in Christ's promises. You see, that's what we're all to keep. We, we trust in Christ's promises to us. Do you trust in them? They've been preserved for us. The Holy Spirit has affirmed that they're true and trustworthy. Earlier in this letter, in 2 Timothy 1.13, he began, he says, Retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. See, the object of faith is, is Christ Jesus. That's the object. Retain those sound words. That's keeping the faith. He wrote also to the Philippians, Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life. Holding fast to the word 
Why? So that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. He kept the faith. And all of that for the future salvation. Verse 8. I never thought I'd be preaching a prosperity gospel. Because I've talked about people that, you know, say you're going to get rich, you'll get to claim it and name it. But there is a sense in which Paul did proclaim a prosperity gospel. But where is that prosperity? It's eternity with Christ. You see, future salvation is our eternity with Christ. That is a prosperity gospel. Not that which can rust and fade away or be stolen or lost. The, the things in this world can. But a life that's placed in Christ. That is eternity with Christ. And it outshines any diamonds or riches or glory or achievements that we ever have in this life. 2 Timothy 4, 8 says, In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also all, all who have loved his appearing. You see, it wasn't just for Paul. It wasn't just for the apostles. It was for you and for me. There is laid up a crown of righteousness. But the righteous judge himself will give. That is Jesus Christ will give. And will award, award to Paul. But also award to you and to me. If we really love his appearing. That crown of righteousness. Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 9 25. He says everyone who competes in the games. Exercise self control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath or crown. It's the same Greek word. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. That's the stuff in this world that will fade away. But we, we who believe and run the race where Christ is the goal, we an imperishable crown. Peter speaks about it in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's affirmed by his resurrection. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved for you and me and how safe is it verse 5 who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time it isn't that we're not already saved. We're saved by faith. But it will be revealed. It will be displayed. When we are given the crown. Peter later called it in 1 Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. We, like the elders, we may throw them at Jesus' feet. We don't know. Many think we will. That is a fine design. But we are promised. It, and the one who will give us is a righteous judge. It'll be through righteous judgment. Why? 
What will this judgment be? It will be by the righteous judge. And it, it is a life that's built upon Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 Three, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, it says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold and silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it will be uh, revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. This is on Christ's mercy seat. For us, there will be a burning away of the things that we did that are not eternal. Things that weren't placed upon Christ's credit and foundation. But we will not be going before the white throne judgment. We will have be given a crown. You see, he is both the just and the justifier. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, 21 through 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law of the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justifier of the ones who have faith in Jesus. You see, it's not on our account. It wasn't even on the great apostle Paul's account. It's on the account of the righteous judge. And the day of that, it's on the day of his appearing. He wrote in, in Titus, Chapter 2, uh, 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and the worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. It's by his doing. And it is for all who love him. Not just Paul's statement, but James as well. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. This and in many other sections we've looked at in Paul's epistles. This is Paul's love song. His swan song. His love song of living for Christ. with faithful perseverance and longing to be with Christ for eternity. What is your, what will be your swan song? Will your song be that you live for Christ, you faithfully persevered, 
And are you looking forward to his appearing? That's a song we should all be singing and living. All for his glory and praise. Let's pray.